Susan Humphrey, Associate Regional Director General, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Lori Nordstrom, Assistant Regional Director, Ecological Services, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, will be joining us to present progress to date to protect native species and restore degraded habitats, as well as propose priorities for future science and action. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lori Nordstrom from the Fish and Wildlife Service. The Great Lakes Basin supports a rich diversity of habitats, fish, wildlife, and plant species, some of which are globally rare. You can see here the Great Lakes piping plover that is listed as endangered in the U.S. and in Ontario. The meadow blazing star, a plant that is often called the monarch magnet and is an important nectar source for pollinators. A painted turtle, the northern leopard frog, a large coaster brook trout from Lake Superior. These are just a sampling of the rich biodiversity we enjoy in the Great Lakes Basin. Thriving habitats and native fish and wildlife communities contribute to the social and economic vitality of the Great Lakes region. Unfortunately, many human activities over the years have resulted in the loss or degradation of habitats, fragmentation of natural systems, reductions in health and abundance of native species, and the introduction of non-native invasive species. To address these issues, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement puts a priority on bringing individuals and organizations together to restore, protect, and conserve the resilience of Great Lakes native species and their habitats. Sue and I have the pleasure of telling you all about these efforts today. Through the Habitat and Species Annex, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement commits the governments to enhancing the resilience of native species and their habitat, as well as supporting essential ecosystem services. When we say resilience of native species, we mean the ability of species and habitat to withstand change and bounce back. Essential ecosystem services refer to the benefits we receive from the ecosystem. We'll provide more information on that later in the presentation. Achieving these commitments is a big job, and the governments of Canada and the U.S. can't do it alone. Everyone has a role to play. Fortunately, we have many partners involved in the activities that are underway. The first thing that comes to mind when you think about the Great Lakes is just how massive they are. As you all know, the Great Lakes make up one of the world's largest freshwater ecosystems, with 16,000 kilometers or 10,000 miles of coastline, connecting river systems, open waters, and watersheds. All of that combined amounts to globally significant habitats and ecosystems. Habitats vary greatly from lake to lake and within individual lakes. The slide shows some of this variety starting with the coastal wetlands of Lake Erie, rocky shoreline and offshore open water habitats of Lake Superior, sandy beaches of Lake Michigan, towering cliffs of Lake Huron, and marshes of Lake Ontario. These landscapes are familiar to many of us, whether we regularly make use of the Great Lakes habitat for recreational purposes or rely on them for our spirituality or livelihoods. Many of us might recognize some of these species who call the Great Lakes Basin home. Of course, the Great Lakes provide a home to many more species than what you see shown, many of which are known as species at risk or endangered species. Some species, such as the spotted gar that you see in the center of this slide, spend their entire life cycle in the Great Lakes. The spotted gar is a species at risk in Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. The species spends all of its life stages in coastal wetlands, areas of shallow ve aquatic vegetation. You can understand then how important it is to protect and restore coastal wetlands for this species and others as well. The piping plover that you see in the upper right hand corner of the slide spends only a part of their life cycle in the Great Lakes Basin to breed. Those bands you see on their legs were placed there by a biologist when the bird was still young and in the nest in order to identify and track the bird's movements during future migrations. They migrate to winter along the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Other species like muskrat or five-line skink are more abundant in the Great Lakes, but are important indicators of quality habitat. 
Muskrat lodges provide a safe spot for waterfowl and rare bird species like the black tern and trumpeter swan to nest on. And they keep areas of marshes open so that important aquatic plants like wild rice can thrive. Where you see a skink, you know you have healthy forested habitats. But if you're in Ontario, around wooded and shoreline areas of Lakes Erie, St. Clair, and Huron, be on the lookout because these animals are more rare and protected as endangered species. As we heard just a little bit ago, the American eel in Lake Ontario is rapidly declining, which is linked to the dams and barriers that have affected their access to feeding and their ability to migrate to spawning areas in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean. A variety of Great Lakes habitats are critical for the resilience of native species which means they can withstand changes in their surroundings and still thrive. Whether they are just abundant in population or vulnerable species of risk, and whether they spend all or part of their life stages in the lakes. You can see where we're going. Protecting and restoring habitats such as these is important. Great Lakes habitat is also more than just home for fish and wildlife. The Great Lakes are home to people too, of course, and their waters and habitat provide inspiration and spiritual connection, especially for tribal and, di and indigenous people who place a strong value on the essential life provided by its waters and land. The Great Lakes provide tremendous recreational benefits, other ecosystem services, which are benefits to people that people obtain from the ecosystem, are drinking water for 40 million people, water supply for numerous business sectors, energy, f food, flood prevention, biodiversity, climate regulation, erosion control, pest and pathogen control, soil formation, and nutrient cycling. The coastal wetlands on the Great Lakes, like this one in Saginaw Bay on Lake Huron, provide aesthetic beauty, but also help filter surface water from the lake's landscape before it enters the lakes. For us in the Great Lakes Basin, having the largest freshwater coastal wetland system on Earth is an awesome responsibility, and it's too important to pro it's so important to protect our habitat for all of us living here and for future generations. Given the multiple and abundant ecosystem services provided by the Great Lakes, Canadians and Americans have made extensive use of this resource, using water for industrial processes, energy production intensive agriculture use, using fish for food and recreational pursuits, and modifying the landscape for development in cities and rural areas, to name just a few. With extensive use comes a toll. The depletion of natural resources, the loss of natural and functional habitat for fish and wildlife, the pollution of waters and bottom sediments, and the introduction of non-native invasive species have contributed to a reduction in the abundance of native species. Hamilton Harbor, as seen in this photo, is the largest Canadian port in the Great Lakes. You can't see it here, but the harbor also contains the largest wetland in Lake Ontario. Industrial use and contamination of the harbor have affected the biodiversity and habitat in the region significantly. You heard of the areas of concern session yesterday, and you heard about the efforts that, would have, been, that have been underway by collaborative, multi-stakeholder partnerships to restore habitat in the harbor. Human population growth, development, and other changes in the Great Lakes region are ongoing and put stress on the Great Lakes habitat and native species at many scales. Local habitat modifications such as shoreline hardening by individual property owners can reduce spawning and nursery areas for fish. Regional land use changes for industrial and urban development can result in loss of coastal wetlands or degraded water quality. Changes in climate on larger ecosystem scale affects water levels, watershed processes, shoreline erosions, and species ranges. These are just some of the examples of the multiple threats to native species and stresses on Great Lakes habitat. It's important to mention here that significant efforts to protect habitat and species and maintain ecosystem service function have been go ongoing at various local, regional, and national scales for several decades. The 2012 US Canada US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement has provided a binational venue for setting binational priorities for addressing habitat issues. Thanks, Lori. 
So while the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was first signed in 1972 and amended several times since then, it wasn't until the most recent amendment in 2012 that Canada and the United States placed a strong emphasis on habitat and species in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement by including a specific annex on habitat and species with commitments to conserve, protect, maintain, restore, and enhance native species, and also a goal of net habitat gain. Activities under this new annex are being implemented in a collaborative fashion in cooperation with federal, state, provincial, and municipal governments, tribal governments, First Nations, and Métis, watershed management agencies, other public agencies, other local public agencies, and the public. There are two major areas of activity we would like to focus your attention on this morning, the biodiversity conservation strategies and the baseline habitat survey. First, biodiversity conservation strategies have been completed for each Great Lake. The completion of all these strategies by 2015 through an extensive collaborative effort of multiple stakeholders met a specific time-bounded commitment in the agreement. So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity or biological diversity means the variety of life in the ecosystem. It is the variability of native species and the wealth of different habitats types in a given area. The lake specific strategies reflect the unique nature of each lake and its conservation needs and are important tools to achieving progress on restoring, protecting and conserving native biodiversity. They provide information on the health of the ecosystem, identify critical threats, outline specific conservation strategies to abate those threats, encourage priority setting on areas, as well as activities to achieve maximum benefit to biodiversity conservation. They are being used by many organizations and agencies to guide their work. Lakewide partnerships and Lakewide Action and Management Plans, or the LAMPs, that you heard all about at an earlier session at this forum, are the principal mechanisms for coordinating the implementation of these strategies. These partnerships develop implementation plans to promote and drive action and report on progress. Here we have a few examples of how the strategies are being used in lake basins to promote on the ground conservation actions. In Lake Huron, the biodiversity conservation strategy has emphasized the need to improve fish habitat around the lake, which is driving efforts in the Pinery Park, Grand Bend, and Port Franks area of southwestern Ontario. The man in the image on the top left is using a reaching pole and probe that takes instantaneous readings of water quality to better understand the effects of nutrient concentrations on the aquatic habitat in the old Asable Channel in Lake Huron, because threats such as water level fluctuations, land use changes, excessive nutrient concentrations, and low dissolved oxygen are affecting three species at risk in the area, the pugnose shiner, the lake chub sucker, and the grass pickerel. Work is ongoing within the local community to monitor the species, collect information on how to resolve these issues, and develop short-term and long-term solutions to protect these species. In Lake Erie, targets and goals from the Lake Erie Biodiversity Conservation Strategy were the basis for the development of a regional implementation plan called the Western Basin Conservation vision, which maps areas to focus, focus local conservation investments to meet regional conservation goals. The map on this slide on the lower left identifies the places where we can advance multiple ecological goals while enhancing places people care about at the, most, at the lowest socioeconomic costs. The more important areas to focus effort are depicted in a darker shade of green. And finally, in Lake Ontario, the restoration of native prey fish species was identified as a priority for the implementation of the biodiversity conservation strategy, leading Canadian and United States agencies to initiate a program to reintroduce the bloater to the lake starting in 2012. In the image on the upper right, 
we see a male bloater fish, and on the lower right, we see the, pro the process of bloater egg collection. So earlier we told you that a primary goal for habitat under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is achieving a net habitat gain in the basin. We'll take a bit of time here to explain the concept of net habitat gain to you. A gain in habitat can be achieved in one of two ways. The first is an increase in area of a certain habitat. For example, more square kilometers of coastal wetlands. The second way to gain habitat is by improving the condition of existing habitat so that it's more healthy and functional for all the species that use it. For example, a wetland that is dominated by the invasive species Phragmites that we heard about earlier on in this forum cannot support a variety of wildlife, which is a big thumbs down. Phragmites chokes out native vegetation from wetlands due to competition for water, light, science, and uh, space, and nutrients. Roots can extend more than six feet into the ground and steal water from other good plants. This impacts fish at their larval and juvenile stages. The plant's roots and litter occupy spawning areas and reduce the mobility of small fish in creeks. Phragmites also deters birds like herons from using an area because of the lack of open water. By removing Phragmites and opening the wetland, native plants grow back and species diversity can return. A huge thumbs up. These photos shown before and after a restoration effort removing Phragmites at the globally rare Chewaukee Prairie area along the, south, along the southwestern shore of Lake Erie, uh, of Lake Michigan, pardon me. Another major activity that has been underway by a large number of collaborating partners over the past two years has been the development of an approach to survey existing habitat in the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem that will be used as a baseline to establish a target for net habitat gain and measure progress over time towards that target. We can assure you there's no easy way to do it. So involving numerous experts in the subject over the past two years has been key to developing an approach that we can all work with over time. The approach which was the subject of a public review over this past summer is currently being finalized into a document for release later this year and involves three phases. The first phase involves delineation of areas into ecosystem types such as shoals, coastal wetlands, river mouths and open waters. These ecosystem types have been created and are maintained by physical processes and lake characteristics that change at a relatively slow rate such as bathymetry and wave energy, as shown in the top two maps. The second phase, phase involves the assessment of each area using dynamic characteristics to determine the condition of the area. Characteristics such as nutrient status as, measure, as measured by chlorophyll A levels, or water quality as measured by Secchi depth, which can be seen in the bottom two images. The third and final phase of the baseline habitat survey involves the review of biological information, such as the presence of fish, waterfowl, reptile, and amphibians. The yellow perch, the green frog, the Blanding's turtle, and trumpeter swans seen here are a few examples of potential species that could be included in this phase. The presence of species or not indicates whether the habitat is suitable to support their life stages. It's during this phase of the survey that we'd also be considering data that help inform the habitat and species indicator and sub-indicators that you learned all about if you attended yesterday's presentation on the state of the Great Lakes. We intend to use existing data to the extent possible for all three phases gathered from multiple sources, collaborators, and initiatives. Many of you in this room lead some of those efforts. Effort to fill data gaps would occur over time. The baseline survey will be conducted on a reoccurring basis. At this time, we plan for every five years, which amounts to one lake per year, 
to track changes in the ecosystem over time and to monitor progress towards targets of net habitat gain. The plan is to conduct the survey in each lake during the same year that the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative is being conducted. And you would have heard all about the CSMI yesterday if you participated in the lake-wide session. Our efforts are first focused in the waters of the Great Lakes for a baseline habit aquatic habitat assessment since one has not been conducted before. This new information will add to existing habitat assessment efforts such as the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Consortium. There are many others as well. Some partners with watershed and landscape mandates are participating in the aquatic habitat assessment and others are encouraged to join us as we work together to better understand the habitat trends and the linkage between watersheds and Great Lakes water quality. The two activities that we just spoke about, the biodiversity conservation strategies and the baseline habitat survey are the primary binational habitat and species related activities that are underway by numerous partners in Canada and the United States. Protection of Great Lakes habitat happens locally too. In the images here, we have examples of these activities with folks working hard sampling habitat and monitoring species while happily enjoying the great outdoors. We see a biologist in the top right hand corner collecting eggs from the bloater to propagate fish in a hatchery, and in the bottom right, banding a piping plover to monitor its survival. We'd also like to mention a few of the unique domestic partner programs that are occurring on a local scale that contribute to the goals of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. In Canada, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans supports local habitat restoration and enhancement through its Recreational Fisheries Conservation Partnerships Program, as does the Province of Ontario through its Land Stewardship and Habitat Restoration Program. And, on, and in the United States, the Interagency Great Lakes Restoration Initiative supports the implementation of local restoration and protection actions for fish and wildlife in all Great Lakes states. Habitat is also enhanced and restored through the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act, which works collaboratively with the states and the tribes to implement high priority conservation efforts for fish and wildlife and their habitat. These are just a few of the numerous important programs that are delivering significant results that benefit Great Lakes habitat and species. Despite the significant accomplishments that we've just described, the job isn't done. We have our work cut out for us over the next three years to address two proposed priorities for science and action. We have begun the implementation of the baseline habitat survey on a regional pilot scale for refining the approach to measure net habitat gain over time. The plan is starting at the pilot scale and we'll, ad and we'll adjust the approach where required before moving it to a lake-wide scale. We're also going to, comp to complete a review of gaps and priorities identified by existing Great Lakes habitat and species conservation strategies and strategic plans and aim to develop a binational framework for prioritizing activities to conserve, protect, maintain, restore, and enhance native species and habitats on a Great Lakes wide scale. We want to conclude by saying that we are very grateful for the commitment of so many dedicated experts and non-experts alike who are working collaboratively to restore, protect, and conserve the resilience of Great Lakes native species and their habitats. Achieving these commitments is a huge job and everyone has a role to play. If you are not already engaged, this is your personal invitation to join us. Thank you.